Hello and welcome everyone to another EventRight live Q&A. My name is Andrew Krause. I co-founded EventRight with Stephen Key over 21 years ago, and we've been coaching and mentoring inventors to license their products ever since. If somebody could type into the uh, questions box, um, yes, that you can hear me, that would be great. So it was good to get confirmation. I don't have my headset today, um, so I'm using the microphone on my computer. It's a little hot in here, so I'm running the AC as well. So let me know if the audio is good. Just write audio good. I don't think you can hear. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So we're just going to jump in and do some, some Q&A here. I want to um, basically remind you that InventRight, what we're all about is licensing. And licensing, I like to do this at the top. of. I'll keep it short, guys, for those of you that like to attend these regularly. But when you license a product to a company, it's their money. It's their workforce and it's their distribution. So you don't need the money. You don't need to go on a silly show like Shark Tank or something. Um, let me get rid of this notification here. You don't need to go on Kickstarter, Indiegogo. These are big companies, big brands, if you will, that have distribution in the stores where you want to be. So they have unlimited money for a product that sells well. They've been in business for a long time, most of them. So they have lines of credit. So you don't need to raise money. It's their money, not yours, okay? Any company that asks you to put money into, that's a red flag. That's not a licensing deal. I'm sure there's some exceptions somewhere. but um, And then you tap into their workforce. So sales, marketing, manufacturing, advertising. I like to think of it as they're working for you. So now they have 50 products and your product is part of their product line. Well, you're just plugging it into that machine where they're doing the accounting, the bookkeeping, the sales, the manufacturing, the advertising, all the things that you need to do to run a business that you don't really get the economies of scale when you just try to sell one product yourself. And that can be very, very difficult. And then the biggest thing you get is existing distribution. So let's say it's a, a certain type of gadget that would show up in a Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, um, place like that. Uh, well, they already have distribution in those places, and the buyers at those retailers take them seriously. Where you, if you try to come in there with a one you one product company, you're underfunded. If you're trying to sell it yourself as opposed to license it, you're just not going to get the time of day compared to that big company. So when you license to that big company, you are that big company. So if you guys could start typing your questions in, um, that would be great into the questions box. And I'll go ahead and answer those. Um, Ke uh, Kevin said, hi, Andrew. I asked for a prototype. The problem is the prototype I've made is amateurish and wouldn't hold up to scrutiny. I replied that I could send them a video of proof of concept. Was that a wrong move? No, I don't think that's a wrong move at all. But what I would do, Kevin, is get on the phone with them. So one of the things we, we make sure that our students do, and you can't do it 100% of the time, but the vast majority of the time, is you need to get on the phone with them so they realize you're not a wacky inventor, you're easy enough to talk to, and you start talking about the product. When If a company shows interest and you've emailed them your sell sheet or a video or something, and they're like, send me a prototype, you should never, ever, ever do that. So it's not like they're going to take your prototype, and they're going to steal your idea. But when they want your prototype or they want to see a patent or a provisional, it doesn't move the deal forward because it's a deal. It's a licensing deal, right? And you need to move it forward and getting on the phone and talking with them and helping them realize you're a person just like anybody else. Otherwise, you're this faceless inventor, right? With this idea, they're not quite sure about you. And getting on the phone with them gets them wrapped up in your project. The fact that they take five minutes, it's never five, right? So probably almost could be at least 10. But the fact that they take five or 10 minutes to talk to you on the phone shows they're sincerely interested. When they just say, send me everything you got, that doesn't really show sincere interest. It took them two seconds to write that. So it's not that you don't want to do those things. It's not that you don't ever want to send your provisional patent or a patent or send a prototype. It's that it doesn't move the deal forward early on. Um, so yeah, I really like your solution though, Kevin, with sending them a video showing it working. And so like sometimes like it's kind of crude, but you kind of shoot it from a distance and you might need to shoot it 10 times before it works right. But that one time it works right and that's the one you're gonna send them. And it's not that 
It's just that you can't make it work right because you don't have those prototyping skills, but you know they can. So just put your best foot forward. That's not lying. There's nothing wrong with that. This thought that you need this production-ready prototype in order to license your product is just absolute BS. Um, I can only think of a couple times where in 21 years of students in 65 countries where we had one of our students where the company said, oh, oh you don't have a beautiful production-ready prototype or, oh, well, no, we're not interested. They're, they're not, any company that's sincerely interested will not do that. So if they want more, they'll ask you for more, but you don't always give them what you want. You get on and you do the things that you know are necessary to move the deal forward. And so that's one of the things that a lot of people are surprised by with licensing. They won't go, oh, here's our formal process for licensing. We're doing this and then this and this. You can ask about it to see, but most of the time they don't have a formal process. Okay, so you need to put them through your process. And if you're an invent rights student, you're putting them through our process. Um, and they don't know. You're not saying that. But like they ask for something and you kind of redirect the conversation. You half answer it like a politician. You redirect it here and it works amazingly well. And it is so important in closing deals. So hopefully that was helpful, uh, Kevin. Uh, Marlon, aloha, Andrew. What is the way to make your invention design prototyping if your basic idea is only sketches on paper? How does InventRight Design Studio help us with modeling and guiding? So for our students, we give our students a cell sheet and a virtual prototype. I would say about these days, about 70% of our students are doing a virtual prototype where, you know, the student's like, well, I couldn't create one myself, so we make what it looks like. Now, it's not a prototype with, like, engineering specs and stuff, but it's something that looks pretty. Oh, that's what it's going to look like. So going back to Kevin's comment, sometimes you have a sell sheet or you're putting this virtual prototype in a video, but they're seeing the benefits of the product, and you also have a YouTube video showing unlisted, never unlisted. And by the way, everything I share tonight is not legal advice. Please seek the service of an attorney if you need legal advice. And so, um, but anyway, uh, I always forget to say that at the beginning, but I always say it at some point in the video. Um, what was I going to say? Sometimes you have a video where it's kind of crude, but they saw the virtual prototypes. So they can see, oh, that's what it's going to look like. And so let's say it's a dog toy. And if they, you know, you show a little closer up at some point, they can see the duct tape, but they see it working. You know, so you can do that as well. It varies with everybody's product. Um, Gray said, hi, Andrew. I'm not able to license. If I'm not able to license my product within one year following my PPA, what are my options? Do and can I modify it? and reapply. So the answer is yes, you can. So you can file that same provisional and get another year. Now you don't get the original year from your first provisional, you get a new year from the new date. Um, and so there's something called the one year on bar rule, which you know starts the, the as soon as you make public disclosure. And so what's public disclosure? Selling it at a swap meet, putting it up on a website, putting it up public YouTube, not unlisted, where only people at the link can see it. Um, making that sort of public disclosure. It's still kind of a gray area as to when you're privately trying to license it to companies, um, that that's considered public disclosure. So what I can tell you is our students all the time will file that provisional again if needed. So sometimes, you know, maybe you, maybe you put it in the closet for a while and you come back to it. Because our students do that all the time too. Like you get these non-specific notes and you're like, I'm moving on another project for now. But I believe in this project. Nobody gave me a reason why it wouldn't work. So you send it to all the people who said no, and six months later, you freaking license it. So in that case, I would file that same provisional again. It's another 75 bucks. It's not a lot of money. And it's fantastic. And it's a, it's a perceived ownership there. Um, but you've got to be careful. Do not make what is definitely public disclosure, which is putting it up on a website, selling it at a swap meet, putting it up in a public YouTube video, posting it on your LinkedIn profile, on your Facebook. That's public disclosure. You have to get a patent from one year from making that public disclosure. Now, the part that's kind of gray, and I did a video with Jake Ward on this, is when you privately just show it for license to an, an individual at a company. That um, is debatable whether that's public disclosure. Sorry, guys. Let me turn off this other one. Um, so, you know, our students all the time will file that provisional again and just keep working on the product. So, you know, but anyway, what everything I shared today is not sort of legal advice. And 
if I went into every little teeny aspect and every variation and every angle for patents and intellectual property, you guys would be like snoring. So that's not what we're all about in a minute, right? We do cover that with our students, and I'm happy to answer those types of questions. But I think the most important thing, Gray, is you're, you're not toast after that year if you haven't publicly disclosed it, you just privately tried to license it. Um, Jeff said, hey, Andrew, how extensive does the term sheet need to be? Should I have one ready or let them fire the first volley? Well, Jeff, we don't always use term sheets. So a term sheet is kind of like, oh, I want a royalty rate. There's going to be minimum guarantees, you know, this and that. Look, I'm looking to license it to you for this royalty, that royalty. So uh, I don't, I see less and less our students doing term sheets, um, but, you know, we're still we're still doing them, so um, it really depends, Jeff. That's kind of a dicey situation. You when you get interest from a company, you need to know when the tenant sent a term sheet. You need sometimes you want them to send the term sheet. It really really depends. So um, you know sometimes it can be a nice starting point, just to basically explain that you're they don't know what you're looking for, but these are things you can discuss verbally, or it's not an official term sheet. But it's uh, just saying we're looking to do a licensing deal and around, you might not even say the royalty rate. It depends on where you are in the negotiation. Um, and we're looking for, you don't really you want to introduce minimum guarantees in a term sheet with our students. Like you're going to do some that later. So you're just kind of get a general feel for what's agreed upon, you know, and that can vary tremendously. So when our students get interest, we put them on with our negotiation coach, Paul, and Paul guides them on when to do what. And then they've got some real life experience, not like just watched a video or read a book and then they misinterpret when to do that because it's very specific to the situation. Um, a lot of times you're not going to do any term sheet. It's going to be verbal. You're going to be discussing it. Yeah, I'm looking to license. And, and you're not like you heard me say minimum guarantees. That's not something you want to bring up early on, but you want to do a licensing deal. So there's all these different stages at which you talk about different things. But by going through the process, you'll have felt it, you'll have experienced it, and then you can do it better yourself the next time. But that that is so dicey that when we have students, we have a licensing coach that helps them through the entire process. But just for negotiations, Paul, our negotiation coach guides them through that because it is that dicey. So we have a specialist just for that. So um, your question, I don't mind you asking a specific question. How extensive does it need to be? It could be really, really nothing, or it could be quite extensive, just talking in common English. Here are the major deal points. Because if the company can't agree with you on the major deal points, there's no licensing deal. Don't call a licensing attorney for two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. And we guide people on what all those deal points are. So um, Glenn said, hi, Andrew, LinkedIn allows for a profile photo and a background photo. Is it good or a bad idea to post your product in the background space so that people you reach out to can see it immediately? It's an absolutely terrible idea to do that. Um, so here's a couple of reasons why. First, what I talked about before is public disclosure. You're like, well, I got a patent on it, but it's still a bad idea. So now you're just showing it out there to the world. It's like they're not special anymore. You approach this marketing manager at a particular company and you just have a post it on your main page. Um, it, it, for lack of explaining it, it looks a little like wacky inventor. I know you think that's weird. It's like, why would I be a wacky inventor just for posting my product up? Now, it might make sense if you've been venturing it and selling it, but if you're trying to license it, Keep it private. They want an exclusive on that. Don't throw it up on your web on a website or on LinkedIn for the public disclosure issues. And then also because it's you, you when you when you reach out to companies on LinkedIn, you ask permission to send it. They gave you permission, and then you sent it to them. And then you're going to follow up with feedback. If you just send it to people, go oh, there's a picture on my site. You'll never even know they looked at it. So you when you go fishing, it's like. I don't know. It's it's just it doesn't make any sense. Don't do it. Don't don't do it. Um, and again, when I share these things, it's not always and all the time. It's usually most of the stuff I talk about is like ninety five percent of the time. There's always exceptions. Okay, 
And people always think they're the exception, and most of the time they're not. But no, I would not post that on your background of your LinkedIn. It doesn't give you the opportunity to know that you got a fish on the hook, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, uh, Arwen said, hi, Mr. Krause, is there any way I could speak with you over the phone? Yeah, if you're interested in the coaching program, you're more than welcome, welcome to book with me. Um, just call the main number on inventright.com. And John, Heather, and Talia will set you up with me. Or just drop an email to Andrew and Eventwright. Let's say I've been watching your um, your YouTube Q and A, Andrew, and I want to I, I want to talk to you about the program. Um, you do I don't do free one on one consulting because that's too time consuming. I mean, this is pretty incredible doing an hour for free here already. But if so, if you're interested in talking to the program, but I'll talk about all the different aspects of the program and how it works and everything. And, um, and we're really mellow. We never try to hard sell anybody. But if you want to do that, Arwen, you're more than welcome to send an email or anybody else. Andrew at inventright.com saying you want to book an appointment with me. Um, Melissa, I got interest from a manufacturer in Pakistan. They never worked with outside submissions but are willing. How should I go about the contract when, it, when the time comes? So... It's, it's tough. We have plenty of students that we've guided to do deals with uh, companies that have never done a licensing deal before, but you got to break them in. So <laughs> all these concepts are going to be foreign to them. So you have to know how to explain it to them. But first, you want to just go fishing and get interest. And then you're going to need to explain. It's not like when the contract comes over, you won't get to the contract if you don't handle the conversation right to get to that point. Okay. So and also the other difficult thing in that such situation, most of the time, Paul, our negotiation coach, will tell you when the right time is. And it's pretty far down the line, since so weeks or months in, is say, why don't you have them send their contract? And then Paul will go through it with our student, explain the whole thing to him, explain the negotiation back and forth. And them, them and their attorney will make the changes and send it back so it doesn't cost you a dime. And it's much better to bloody their contract than to create yours and send it to them but sometimes this company in Pakistan has never done any licensing then that's going to be a pain because that might be what you have to do but like I've explained many times there's two stages to a negotiation there's initial interest to contract then contract to close there's two stages and so initial interest to contract way more important so if you don't have the right conversations Melissa you won't get the contract so saying how should I go about the contract when it comes it probably won't come because they don't know how to write one now, they might hire a licensing attorney and write one. Maybe, maybe not, but you need to get it there, and there's a lot of things you need to do to get it there. But it's a very good question. So I'd move forward, providing they have distribution in the places you want to be. If they're just a contract manufacturer, they have no distribution, that's not a potential licensee. So you don't just want a company that can make it. You want a company that can make it and has, it in all, has other products in that same category in all the stores where you want to be. Does that make sense? So sometimes people get confused about that when they're licensing early on. Oh, this company makes gardening implements. Well, if they don't have distribution in Ace Hardware and Lowe's and Home Depot and Walmart and Target, what's the point of licensing to them? There is no point. So companies have the money, the workforce, the existing distribution, and they'll have the manufacturing too. It doesn't matter. People get wrapped up in this. It doesn't matter if they have a captive, they have their own manufacturing plant, which a lot of people don't. Or they contract, they have a contract manufacturer doing it for them. It doesn't matter. You know, it's their manufacturing, right? So hopefully that was helpful, Melissa. Um, and I want to get this right. Anilton? It's an I. Anilton. Um, is it smart to send you, to send your, I think you meant to say your product by postal mail, if you live on the other side of the world, they claim not to have an email wall company. Well, wall is a big company um, for, for hair clippers. Um, they claim not to have an email. That's a red flag. I, you know, there's so many companies out there. I need to look it up. But I don't know if wall is open or not. Any company that, ex that insists that you, I don't know if that's what they're saying, mail it to them. They're not interested in your product. Right, straight up. That's so ridiculous that they couldn't receive an email. They're trying now. They might be, and they're just so old school, and that's their way of filtering it out. But I, my money is on that's their way of 
basically not receiving ideas. So they don't need to go through them. Um, it doesn't really make any sense. But could you print up your sell sheet and email it? Yeah. If you have a video, you have to put the link there. They would then have to type into YouTube. When our students send a sell sheet, it's a one-page PDF you email or a YouTube video unlisted so nobody can see it except for people that you send the link to. So, Anilton, you either didn't talk to the right person or they're basically stonewalling you because that's just kind of silly. Um, uh, let's see. Kevin, Andrew, let's say you have interest from more than one company. Our students do all the time. It's very normal. But initial interest is not the closed deal. It's the difference. Reach out to 25, 30 companies. Five companies show interest. Maybe you end up talking to four of them. Three fall off and you end up doing a deal with one. Is that normal? Yeah. Also, call 30 companies. One shows interest. You end up doing a deal with them. It's all over the map, but it's very normal. You get interest from multiple companies. Is there a best way to inform a company you aren't choosing them in order to not burn bridges? It's You don't really need to do that most of the time. There is a point at which you do, and I can only think of like a couple times in our history where that's happened, where it, it created some tensions. Most of the time it doesn't. So this is what I advise you to do there. Move forward with all the companies as if the other ones don't exist. Do not tell them. They say, "Are you? have you shown us any companies? Of course, I'm shopping around, but never say the names and never discuss anything that you share with another company because they're going to think, well, they're telling me all the stuff that they share with this other company. Another company share with them. Now we're not going to we're not going to talk to this guy because he's going to share confidential stuff we share. So don't kiss and tell is what I'm saying. But um, most of the time, Kevin, it just plays itself out. You know. So let's say you get you get a lot of traction, you get interest from five, but like three of them fall off pretty quickly. Oh, well, we know not because these things. So now you only got two, you keep moving forward, and the other one falls off now for different reasons. So they naturally fall off. To go around notifying people early on, which is not what you were saying, it's just a waste of your time, it's stupid, you're gonna be shooting yourself in the foot. Now, now here's where you gotta be careful. When they start spending money on making prototypes, like they spend five grand on this prototype, okay, now you gotta start having conversations that's where you can get yourself into trouble or they've been dragging and dragging and dragging like forever um but they're saying they're really interested well it's like you know pony up you know but um when they start spending money and they start using lots of resources lots within their company not oh we'll just go get some quotes it's not the same thing maybe making prototypes getting really actively involved that might be the time to to discuss it you know but again, that's one of those dicey things that you really got to look at the particular situation. And that's why we have a negotiation coach that, that helps people through that. Um, let's see. No, no real name here, but the black Inu Yasha. Inu Yasha. That's kind of cool. Uh, hi, Andrew. Just finished my sell sheet, including a drawing of my prototype. How long will it take to file a PPA or just call companies now. Uh, filing a PPA is immediate. So when you file it, you get a notice back, you file it legally, you can say patent pending on your sell sheet. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. When you get a provisional, you can say patent pending, which is really freaking cool. You know, and if they ask you, oh, is it a provisional or patent? Always oh, to be truthful and say it's a provisional. So um, I would, and we advise all our students um, to uh, always file that provisional before you start calling, but it's pretty much immediate. Um, you can file it yourself or you can use our smart IP software on inventright.com. I think it's under the other services. I think it's like 99 bucks. And then you got to pay the patent office fee of 75 bucks. Um, and that's a one-time use for our students. We let people get unlimited use of it for our students. So um, I would file it to be conservative before you start calling. I love your go-getter attitude though. Um, Gray said, thank you. You're welcome, Gray. Um, reality. Reality DRB. Okay. Uh, what if your invention involves new unknown knowledge? How do you convince them that your invention works without setting them a lot, setting them a two-market prototype? Well, 
Um, a lot of times, you know, it's uh, for simpler products. This might not be your your situation in reality, but um, you can cite similar products and go, well, there's that and that, and I just changed the hitch, and they're like, oh, well, that company made that and that, and you're just changing that, and you you just educate them about your change. So, um, how do how do can you convince them? And you're saying your invention involves new unknown knowledge. Well. Whatever. I don't know what that means, but um, so if if there are similar products and you can say, well, there's this and this, and I just changed this, and you understand your change, good enough. You should it should be pretty clear. And a lot of times you can do that. Now, a, a silly example that I always give is like, you know, if you're like, well, I got this new robot, and I've given this example before. It jumps up on your roof and it shingles your house for you, so people don't need to sweat in the hot sun. And, there's no workman's comp worries of somebody falling off the roof and it's going to be cheaper. And, and the company's like, well, how do we make that? And you're like, I don't know. I just think it's a good idea. Well, okay. That's wacky inventor territory, right? So what's the, what's the middle ground between that being wacky inventor territory and like, Oh, well, here's some examples of other things. And I just made this change and there is some stuff that's in between. Um, so if you can create something, that works, but maybe you don't need to send them a prototype. You can show it working. Now, if you can't create it, but you can cite the technology or other products that might make sense, then maybe that's fine reality. You know, that, that can work. So again, when we help our students, we guide them specifically for their particular product, what is gonna make sense here? And I'll look at some things and I'll go, Okay, no, this is pretty obvious, you know, and we just do the marketing. So you get the interest. And then we'll say these things. And and maybe there's sometimes there's things that you need them to figure out. That that happens sometimes. And maybe you can put some of that technical research onto them. It really depends on the product. I can't really say for sure, because it's dependent on the product. But I can tell you, we've never had a student that we couldn't guide in that area, but you gotta look at the product. Um, Trevor says, how much value do you feel there is in a PPA versus a utility patent application? Well, they're, they're all perceived protection. So there's different levels here. So there's the provisional patent application, which is, you notice how I put the word pat application behind it? So, and patent attorneys will beat me up about this if I don't say it. So I always try to say it because they're right. It's not a patent. It's an application. So it's a provisional patent application. So it holds your place in time. If you don't later file a full utility patent and reference that provisional, you're not getting protection for anything. And you're still not getting protection on it even when you reference it. Because when you file a utility patent, a full patent, it can take the patent office a year to three years to get back to you. So that entire time it's pending, you can't go around suing people. You don't have any real protection. It's perceived protection. It's pending possible protection. But it seems to be enough for our students to do deals. So if, if and here's the, the, for those of you that are new, here's the stupid way of looking at things. So if you, if you think, and a patent attorney may think this, and other people may think it, but it's wrong. If you think you, you need to file a patent, and sit around waiting one to three years for the patent office to have office actions with your attorney and, and then grant the patent. Most of the stuff's not even gonna make sense anymore by the time the patent issues. That's ridiculous. So first of all, it's ridiculous to spend 10 grand on a patent, not even knowing if you have anybody interested in licensing it. If you spend 75 bucks, you get to see if anybody's interested. If nobody is, you haven't spent 10 grand because you're not gonna spend 10 grand on a patent every time you come up with an idea your wife, your spouse, yourself, your family's going, what are you doing, right? And so a big part of the event right approach is why spend money you don't need to when the patent office gives you a whole year to fish off the end of the year. Now, people get really excited about the provisional, they file it and they just sit on their hands. Our students, when they file a provisional, they're calling companies like the next week or the next day. So they got a whole year, you never need a year. You know if the idea is legs in three or four weeks to three or four months, right? And so you don't ever need the year. So people are like, oh, my, but it's running out, but it's running out. It's because you filed it and you didn't know how to instantly start reaching out to companies. And that's fine. I understand that. But that's why a lot of people are like, only a year? 
I'm like, why would you need more than that? You know, most of the time. Um, let's see. So, God, I forgot where I was here. Who was it? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was Trevor. How much value do you feel there is in a PPA versus utility patent? So a pending utility patent and a provisional patent, they're both just perceived protection because they're not actual protection. Even when you get a patent that is granted, it is still just perceived protection because no one's going to sue companies for you. You're going to have to sue them. So it's just perceived protection. So don't think that a patent or a pending patent is this iron kryptonite protection because it's not. So here's the great protection that is equally as good as a patent. When you license your product to a really big company, they will go to bat for your product. And they're big, right? The knockoffs are afraid of the big guys, but they're not afraid of you if you're manufacturing this in your garage and you're selling a few units. So when you license to a big company, you are that big company, and they can bring product to market very fast. Maybe they're doing 10, 20, 50, 100, 200,000 units a year. Depends on the product, right? So they have the distribution. So they can tap into their distribution and be first to market. And so let's say the company likes to sell 80% of the product and there's about 20% where the companies are knocking them off. Well, even these big companies won't run around suing people. They'll, it's a very affordable thing for them to send a cease and desist. They have a trailer attorney to write a cease and desist to the company knocking it off. And the little companies, for the most part, they'll be like, oh, damn, that's a big company. Okay, we better stop that. Maybe, maybe not. But congratulations, you're successful. So what I'm saying is a big form of protection is licensing it to a really big company and then being first to market. That is a better form of protection than a patent. Okay? Patents are just perceived protection. So thank you for that question, Trevor. I love that question. Uh, Damien typed question marks. I don't know, Damien, can you clarify why you type question marks? Um, and Anil, Anilton, hi, Andrew, how long can you license your idea? Infinitely, forever. So you might think like, well, a patent's 20 years, so it's 20 years. Yeah, but what if you come up with an improvement to it? So the company could keep selling it beyond 20 years, or maybe something comes into the market and after five years, your product's not relevant anymore, but you give them a new version that is relevant and you license that to them as well. And they keep selling it eight or nine years more, right? But I mean, just because a patent's 20 years, I mean, how many products sell for 20 years? Some do, but not many, let's be honest. So some products might go crazy for two or three years and boom, just something else comes to the market, not selling anymore. Some like, especially some niche product that, you know, not a lot of people want to knock off. It might, it might sell for 15, 20 years. It might, but not that many products sell for 15, 20 years. Um, so it's, you know, usually the agreements, I get this question a lot. I talked to somebody about that this morning. They're usually three to five years, but, and I'm surprised sometimes companies don't put in there, like if they were smart, well, but we can continue to, license it if we keep the minimum guarantees, the minimum amount they need to pay. If they, if they sell more, you get more, but they got to keep these minimums. And why wouldn't you? I mean, if they're doing really well, why wouldn't you want to let them keep selling it forever? But I'm always shocked by companies that don't define what happens after three or five years, or they don't insist that we define it. It blows me away because it's like putting them over a barrel. But let's be honest, they're selling a ton of product. Why would you want to pull it from them? You'd be shooting yourself in the foot. So there is no, and in Alton, um, there is no limit to how long. Uh, but the way you keep it going longer is to always come up with that next version, extensions um, to the product line, all that sort of thing. That's how you can keep a product going. Okay. Uh, uh, the black Inuyasha, I like that. Uh, if I get a bite, how can I get invent right licensing help? Well, you'd sign up for our one-on-one -on -one coaching program and we would help you. Just go to inventright.com and you can learn more about that. Um, well, okay, I wanna, so TD said, love to talk to you more about this, but the chat won't let me type enough to convey my question. 
Oh, okay. Um, but TD, uh, and by the way, don't share anything confidential in the chat. Nobody has thus far, but don't do that because this is a public meeting. Um, let's see what you wrote, TD. Uh, I invented a system that will save lives, the environment, and millions of dollars per incident. Problem is I tried to market it to some manufacturers, but the pandemic, but the pandemic put the brakes on that and my money. Um, do you partner with inventors for equity? No, we do not. So our students, when our, we've never partnered with one of our students in 21 years, and we never will, because we're all about empowering our students. So when our students sign up with us, they keep 100% of the royalties. We don't try to sell them other things, and everything is confidential. And if the coach is like, oh, hey, I got this improvement for you, it's yours. So that way it's really clean and transparent. Um, usually when people say, I'm not saying this is you, TD, but they want to partner. What they want to say is, I got this great million-dollar idea, and I just want to dump the whole thing on you. And that's the antithesis of our business model, which is to empower you so you learn through real life experience. Yeah, we're making sure you do it every, say everything right on your projects while you're working on them with us. So you have the highest chance of licensing, but also you're getting that real life experience because watching a video or reading a book or listening to this Q&A, you don't really know it until you do it. So people experience it with us and we want people to say at the end of six months, I get it guys, I don't need you anymore. I can license products the rest of my life. And the only way you do that is through real life experience. So if we did that for people, we wouldn't be doing what our entire mission is. So that's the reason why we don't partner with TD. I don't mind you asking. Um, uh, Angel said, can I share my idea with P&G, that's Procter & Gamble, without any protection? Um, I don't know what their current policy says, but uh, good luck licensing the P&G. They're what I call a mega corporation. So I could count them on two hands, mega corporations like Apple, Google, Procter & Gamble companies like that. And they're just too damn big. You know, you can license a really big companies of distribution and all the major big box retailers, but P&G is just too big. And they wear patents like badges. And I believe, I don't know what their current policy is, but if you read it, it's more or less saying, we don't want your ideas. Like when, when a company says in the past, I've seen up there, we'll only talk to you if you've issued patents. Well, that's, again, remember how I said it earlier? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. They're saying, we don't want your ideas. Um, they're too big. They're more afraid of you than you should ever be of them um, because they're afraid of lawsuits and stuff because they're so damn big and they have so much money. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't see that happening. I've, the only thing that our students have ever gotten from P&G is some attorney, which is not who you want to talk to, grilling you about the intellectual property getting as much as they can out of you. This is another reason why I want to show them your PP or your past stuff. And then just filing it away. And you don't even get to talk to marketing. And then it just boop, just disappears. And they got that. So like collecting data. And it feels weird. It doesn't feel right because it isn't right, in my opinion. Um, so, but when I have anybody that's like, oh, it's for P&G. And I'm like, well, you got this and this and this and this company too. And they're like, oh, yeah. You know, so... Inventors will have a tendency to go after like these one or two big mega mega corporations, um, and it's just not um, it's just not going to happen most of the time. You can go after really big companies, but really big. But a PNG is a mega corporation. A Google is a mega corporation. Um, uh, an Apple is a mega corporation. I only put very few into what I define as a mega corporation. Right, we're too big to do a deal with. Um, maybe one day one of our students will do a deal with them. Uh, we had one student do a deal with a major automotive company, which is next to impossible. They did it. They couldn't even talk about it publicly because they had signed an NDA and we couldn't even use them as a testimonial. I, wa I wanted to like shoot myself in the head after that because I was like, it sucks because we worked our asses off um, to help them close that deal. And they couldn't even talk about it. That was kind of unusual. Um, don't mean to complain about that, but. Um, uh, uh, Waleed, uh, hi, Andrew, a big company writes on its submission form. They are free to make and use any use related, anything related to my submission without any obligations. Is this normal? No, it's not. normal. And, and it's funny. I get people asking me that all the time. And it's like, 
why are you even asking me? This says right there. They own whatever you send them. Um, now, if you've got intellectual property, I'm not even sure if that's legally binding, but they are telling you they don't want your ideas. Now, fortunately, that's not many companies, but when you see that, go, I'm not sending to that company and do not force it. They're making a very clear statement, um, but it's not common. And don't get upset about it. So what? So like one in 20 companies that you look up, you know, would have something like that. I don't even, I don't think it would be that much. I think it's probably more like one in 50 or 80 or 100. Would I would ever see that? You know, it's very uncommon. Um, but you do see it sometimes. Um, uh, do, do, do. Jeff said, Church and Dwight only accepts ideas via snail mail. Um, weird. Very weird. Um, you know, go for it. If that's really important licensee to you, go ahead and send it to them. Maybe that's the way of filtering them out. And you'll be the one that they, one of the few people that bothers to send it. But yeah, just print up your sell sheet and, um, you know, but don't go sending a prototype or something. Um, let's see. Uh, Anilton, thanks, Andrew. You, you, I appreciate you all the way from Holland. Cool. What time is it, man? For you, it's like, uh, what is it, like almost 1, 1 a.m. in the morning probably? Thank you. That's very flattering you're on. Um, Uh, Angel said, how much does it cost for InventRight to do a PPA for me, or do you do just show us how? It, it, we give you software. We have that smart IP software, Angel. You don't need to go to a patent attorney. If you go to a patent attorney, they'll charge you $1,500 to $2,500 to do a PPA. You can use our smart IP software, and you can file a provisional patent, and you only have to pay the patent office fee of $75. Bucks. So the, our software is $99, bucks, and if you become a student, it's free and unlimited use, but you can do the one-time use on our website. For 99 bucks, and then the provisional patent, if you're a micro-entity, which uh, most of you are, um, at 75. So what is that? A total of 174 bucks. Way better way to go. Then you're empowering yourself. Every time you come up with an idea, you know how to write a provisional patent application. So, Angel, I would use our smart IP software. Um, but getting back to that, don't do it now. If you are going to be reaching out and licensing, um, looking at all the products in the space of your invention, thinking about all the other variations of your product, throwing those in your PPA. So when you are ready to start reaching out to companies, that's when you follow your PPA. Then you get the whole year. So don't be another one of these inventors that just, oh, I'm so excited because there's this thing called a provisional patent. I want to protect my idea and you just want to protect it. And then you just sit on your hands for a year. What's the point of that? So the chances that somebody else comes up within a few months it takes you to prepare to reach out to companies um, is not that much. But it's only 75 bucks. so if that makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. You know, but it's the wrong order of things to file a PPA first. You need to know all the other products in the space of your invention because it's going to affect different things you include in your provisional path, right? Um, and then you want to think about all the variations of your invention and include them. And, and when inventors are new to that, they're not so good at that. Our coaches will guide our students to go, well, I, I could see this being done a lot of different ways. And then you're like, oh, okay, I'll throw those all in my provisional. Um, well, thank you, Kevin. And so the fact that you take an hour out of your day after a hard day's work to help strangers speak volumes for InventRight as a whole, absolute gentleman. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's funny. I don't know why I do these at the end of the day because I probably do look pretty tired, but um, I should probably do them earlier in the day. But everybody, I think, you know, I think it's a good time for everybody, and I've been enjoying doing it. I started doing this live YouTube stream at the beginning of the pandemic, and I never stopped, and people seem to really appreciate it. Um, and so, you know, before we get off, we've got about 15 minutes just in case some of you leave early. Um, if you are not subscribed, please click the subscribe button to our YouTube channel as your way to thank me for spending an hour out of my day to do this. So it doesn't, it's not like you get spam or anything, if you click subscribe, nothing really happens, but we're trying to get from 40,000 something subscribers to 80,000 in the next six months. So that would be one way you can help me. Another way you can help us, we're trying to get to 800 reviews between the expanded condition, edition of One Simple Idea, our book, it's called One Simple Idea, and our old edition, 
we've, we're only like eight reviews short of 800. Stephen says five star reviews for our book. So if you have read our book, one simple idea, go on to Amazon. It can just be a sentence or two. Write a, a five star testimonial. And we only need eight more. You guys could maybe do that for us just tonight if you've read One Simple Idea and you haven't written or written a review. And we want to get to 800. So I, I let Stephen know I would reach out to you guys. He's like, oh, no, Andrew, you don't have to do that. I'm like, yeah, I'll, you know, I spent an hour answering their questions. It's a great time to ask for a favor. So subscribe to our channel and write a review on Amazon for One Simple Idea if you've read it. Um, Let's see, William said, hi, Andrew, is there a way to reach out to companies if a product may not be patentable, but nothing exactly is like on the market? Thank you for your time and expertise. We get students, William, licensing all the time on non-patentable products. I would always still, even if you believe it's not patentable, I would still spend the 75 bucks to get a provisional patent, and that way you can legally put patent pending on there. Just keep them guessing. It keeps us honest companies honest, right? And so to think that you can't do a licensing deal. Of course, I don't know your particular product, William. Our students do deals all the time. They have a provisional patent. Maybe it's just, you know, you're never gonna get a patent on that. Or you might get a patent on, but the company's like, we don't care. And we'll make the licensing deal dependent on the product and the know-how itself. And you can do that licensing deal where they have to pay you regardless, even if you don't have a patent. And you'd be surprised how often they agree to it. Now, not every company in every industry is okay with that, but you'd be surprised how often they're like, hey, this is a great product. You came to it with us. We're not going to like stab you in the back and try to sell it you know, behind your back and, and not pay you for it. And so because now you might be wrong, but it's not patentable, but um, get a provisional patent on anyway just to be able to say patent pending. Because um, you could scribble on a piece of paper with a crayon and the patent office will grant you the provisional because they don't review it. It's just a place and time. Now, don't do that. Um, write up what the product is. But um, don't think you can't license non-patentable products because you can. Okay. Um, Tammy said, what if you already sold an earlier version as a one-time business-to-business transaction? Can you stop selling it and instead change to licensing it instead? Or does it prevent future licensing? No, not at all. Uh, whatever you can get the manufacturer, the brand that you license to, to agree to, you can do. So if they want you to stop selling this other version, you could stop selling that other version. If they're okay with you still selling the other version, it's whatever make it, makes sense. But the, the rule is that I always say is that you can't license to two companies where they're stepping on each other's toes, selling the exact same shelf in the exact same stores, right? But if they're like, oh yeah, that doesn't bother us, that's fine. Or yeah, we want you to stop selling that, but yeah, we'll do a licensing deal. So we have plenty of students that have been selling the product before they come to us, and it's a mixed bag. Some people are like, man, Andrew, I'm struggling. I'm making like minimum wage here, man. I'm just like been working on this thing for years. I know a big company can take this, but I just don't know how to get the right distribution. Or on the other end of the spectrum, man, I'm drowning in success. I, I can't handle running this business. I know a big company can do even better than I can. I can't handle running this business anymore. I need to license it or other people are in between. So absolutely, if it's been sold before, you can still license it. Absolutely. Um, Can I get a new provisional patent uh, on something that the concept is the same, but the design is slightly different? You can always get a new provisional patent because they don't review them. So um, yeah, and and so quite often our students, they'll do a provisional patent, they'll talk to companies, they'll realize they need to change something, and then before they change it and show it to the company, because you got some feedback from the company, you'll file a provisional on your new version, and then you'll show it to them. Isn't that a great strategy? That's a lot better than spending $10,000 on a patent every time you come up with a variation, which is nuts. Um, that's why patent attorneys don't always like us. The good ones do, but because we show you workarounds. Um, uh, let's see. So we get this, I get this question a lot. Um, Costi says, hi, Andrew, what is the first step after having the product idea. Thanks for the time uh, in sharing with us. So your very first step 
whenever you have a product idea, it should always be to get onto Google Images and study all the other products in that micro category. So if you have a barbecue spatula, you need to know every freaking barbecue spatula out there. And that kind of work can take two to six hours to do it, but you need to know everything out there um, that is in that space. And as I always say, your goal isn't to prove that your product is better than everything. That is the wrong attitude. Don't go, well, well I'm just gonna try to prove my product doesn't exist. No, look at these other products that are kind of in the same area, make kind of maybe, um, somewhat the same benefit and be honest with yourself about okay that one's just a nice cheap solution that one's super high end this one solves these problems this will solve and how does mine fit in and be level headed about it don't be like that sucks and that sucks mine's better than that mine's better than that that's not being a good marketer okay so that's the first step Google images Google shopping um, are my favorite places obviously for industrial products, commercial products, which plenty of our students are working on well. Um, Google Images can work pretty well for that as well. Google Shopping, not so much. Amazon, not so much for commercial industrial products. But Google Images works pretty well across the board. Got to use a lot of different keywords. So Costi, that's your first step, not to run out and get a patent, okay? Um, uh, the black in Inuwa, Inu, Inuyasha, I like saying that. Uh, the first time catching you live, do companies just ignore less than stellar prototypes, art? So he's saying like, if I don't have this great prototype or artwork, um, you really should have a virtual prototype that looks good. And um, you shouldn't have this like sketch that was drawn with crayon and stuff. You wanna do a marketing piece that their customer would see. And it needs to be good. They need to get it in six to 10 seconds. And if your uh, designs are too crude, um, but you don't have to actually make the actual product, you need a virtual prototype or drawing of some kind that really looks good. And usually it's a virtual prototype is what we do for our students. We found that works really, really well. Um, so now, if you like, got like a novelty product or something, those companies just like, hey, a rough sketch is fine, you know, because you need to pitch them a lot of ideas before you get one that hits. So there are instances where um, having something a little bit more crude makes sense, but most of the time I, I, I show something pretty good, but you don't have to make an actual prototype. It could be a virtual prototype. Um, uh, J, J. Bell, hi, Andrew. What is the average range of income the first year or two for someone who licenses a product to a big box store? Well, that's good. It's pretty specific. So your royalty rate is going to vary tremendously based on a few things. Your royalty income, I should say. Um, I, I cover this pretty much every session, but it's not just the royalty rate. People are like, oh, you know, what Andrew said, a common royalty rate is 5%. It can be 5 to 10% for consumer products. Sometimes for massive, massive volume products, it could be as low as 3 um, But people get too obsessed about the royalty rate. It's the royalty rate. And then the price of the product, is it a $0.99 cent product? Is it a $500 product? Because that's what you're getting the royalty rate on. And then the volume that's being sold. Are they selling 1,000 units a year? Or are they selling... 100,000 units a year, or are they selling a million units a year? So it's all over the place, Jay Bell. I mean, it's you got to use those three figures, you know. But I can say that if it's in a big box store, which because you got more specific there, if you if you can kind of you can kind of run the numbers, you can go, okay, if it was in every if they are in Walmart, they're gonna put in every Walmart, and they have this many Walmarts. Like if they if the Walmart isn't selling like one unit per week per store, that product's getting kicked to the curb anyway. So you could calculate one unit per week per store at $59.95 or whatever your product is at a 5% royalty rate. And you that would be like a minimum guarantee. So, you know, I, I have students that earn like on some little gag, I, I'm gonna go extreme here, range, okay? Like some little gag novelty gift that is a mom and pop operation and they're only going to sell 3,000 units over its entire history and you're earning just very, very little. Or this company that's going to be selling 200,000 units or half a million units a year and you're probably selling for $29.95. So, you know, it could be 10,000 a year, 20, 50, 100, 200K or more a year in royalties. I mean, 
if you're earning 200K a year in royalties and it sells for five years, that's a million dollars, you know? Um, but I don't like to sell the get rich quick. It varies tremendously based on the product. Um, but what I can say is these companies are really big. So for them to do really big volume is not weird. For you to say, I'm going to sell, you know, 200,000 units with this company that nobody knows. I have no track history. I have no distribution in any stores. That's a hard nut to crack. And the retailers don't want to deal with you because Walmart and other big retailers have crushed little guys that they've brought on. And then that little guy doesn't know how to manage things or completely depend on that retailer. Then the retailer pulls the order and they're sitting there with massive inventory and it bankrupts them. So they don't really want to deal with you. So when you re major retailers, but the manufacturers that sell to these retailers, they want to deal with them because they're big and they already have products in their store and they know they're going to deliver quality on time and do what they say they're going to do because they don't want to lose those accounts. So you can, I joke, have delusions of grandeur when you're licensing and you're not delusional. You can think big, which is really cool. And it's the way most inventors naturally think anyway. Um, but not all deals are going to be big deals. Um, uh, Watcher, Watcher says, do you ever choose a fixed fee over a license? No. Um, and that's, that's like a major, major rookie move to say things like, I want to sell you my invention or I want to sell you my patent. Stupid, stupid, stupid. That's not the right approach. It's taking down exact path you don't want to go down. You want to receive a small, I want to receive a small royalty per unit. So when you guys make money, I make money. You know, of course, they're going to say, well, what would that royalty be? And you say, well, it all depends on what you're going to do with the product. Let's talk, you know, about the product. They can send you a term sheet at some point. But um, so, no, you do, you will never get what it's worth. Even major, huge companies huge, huge companies, they don't want to pay you money up front. They haven't made a dime on it yet. Some products fail, some products don't. If it fails, you get it back. But they don't want to pay you all this money up front. Plus, they're investing hundreds of thousands to launch the product, maybe, maybe 50, 100K, whatever. And now you're asking for a bunch of money up front. That doesn't go over well, you know. So get your money on the back. And as they make money, you make money. That's how licensing works. Now, if you've ventured and you've been selling it yourself and you're in 10,000 stores and you have 20,000 units of inventory, of course, there's going to be some sort of buyout plus a licensing deal there. But most of our students, they don't, so you don't even have a prototype. You have a virtual prototype. You're licensing this thing and um, you're doing a licensing deal. Um, Jazz said, hi, Andrew, tried marketing, but no one picks calls or answers emails out of 35, maybe five answered. Well, that's not bad. During the past three months. So it discouraged me. How do you overcome this in your opinion? So what I could say is, you know, first off, what are you sending to them? Um, why are you just reaching out on the phone? You should be reaching out on LinkedIn and the phone. I like you just picking up the phone. Are you saying the right things to the gatekeeper? Are you sending the right materials? Are you following up like crazy? Um, looks like you only got into five of 35 companies. You're probably doing a lot of things wrong. But one thing you're doing right is you're reaching out. I mean, five answered. I don't know how many you actually got your sell sheet to. So, but you should utilize LinkedIn as well as phone. And you really got to take a look at what you're saying and what you're requesting and how you're presenting yourself. So I, I can't know, but, um, you know, some of our students now, they're getting like 80 to 90% hit rates on LinkedIn. And, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of reaching out on the phone. Like, I can't get a hold of people on LinkedIn. Reach out on the phone. Like, use whatever method you can to get to them. You're probably also, Jazz, not following up enough. Even with our students, Early on, we noticed students aren't following up enough, and the coach is there to constantly push them. No, push harder. No, okay, you know, don't you don't want to email them every day. Did you get it? Did you get it? You don't want to do that, but you want to be really persistent and consistent. But if you've been doing it for three months and you only got five companies to answer and pick up, you're doing something wrong. Um, and, you know, and I don't know what industry you're into. There's sometimes you do different things for slightly different industries. Um, 
So uh, let's see. Yeah, it looks like we came up on the hour. Um, if I could, um, if I could ask you guys to do me a favor, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube show, to subscribe to our YouTube show, just click on that subscribe button. I think I don't know if on the live stream it shows up. I think it shows up right there. Um, that would be a huge favor. The other favor is if you've read One Simple Idea, our book, go on Amazon and write a review for it. Between the old and the new edition, we have 800 five-star reviews, Stephen tells me. Um, Stephen's our other co-founder. And um, we only need like eight or nine more to get to 800. So if you guys could do that, that would be a huge favor I'm asking in exchange for me doing this hour of Q&A. That would be fantastic. Um, if you're interested in our coaching program, go to InventRight, click on the Contact Us, book with one of our advisors to talk about it. They're, Eli and Sylvia are super friendly. Nobody will over hard sell you. So if you just want to talk about the program and you're considering it for the future, you can go ahead and do that. And um, I just want to thank you all for, um, for coming on tonight. And, uh, and you ask great questions. I know when I do these live Q&As, it's a lot of the same questions, but there's always a few new ones in there. So hopefully you guys found that was useful. Watch a bunch of our other YouTube videos too. I think we have over, over 650 free YouTube videos and we're not like constantly pitching our, our course or anything in there. So we give a lot of free education to educate the inventor community. Um, so, and then um, go to our website, subscribe to our newsletter. If you go to inventright.com, if you can find that on our website, maybe that's too hard to find, but, and I just want to remind you guys to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See you guys. Bye.